Hi, Ed here from Crystal Clear Aquatics. Um, I've just arrived on site this morning to start my latest small project, which I thought I'd share with you guys. So this is the pond that I should be working on. It's a, a lovely lined pond. Stuff full of Elodia crisper. Lots of little fish in here. It's a static pond. There's no filtration system to speak of. Um, there, is a, there is a fountain, which you can see sort of a skew on the side there. Um, but essentially it's a natural pond relying on the plants to um, clear the pond naturally and create good conditions for the fish. But the issue is, as a lot of ponds, when the water level drops from evaporation, you've got this strip of pond line, which is visible at the back of the pond here, particularly when viewed from the house. I mean, it's, it's on show all the way around. But this, this wall at the back here, there's been a few issues with birds coming along and taking out moss for, for nesting material. Um, and when the pond drops a few inches from evaporation, that, that becomes quite unsightly. So the brief for this job is to do something to conceal that, that visible strip of lining. Now we're only focusing on the, on the back wall of, of liner here. So from, from this section over here, that rock, over to the start of the, the slope at the back there. Um, as that's the, uh, that's the visible bit. The rest of the pond, the birds don't seem to really be playing with. You can see at the back here that none of that liner is particularly visible. Um, I mean, this is quite a classic way of concealing the edge of lining by having a strip of, of turf like this over the off cut. And it does work generally, but there are issues with doing this. Now, one of the biggest issues with trying to conceal the liner with grass like this, and actually in this application it's working pretty well, is that if you've got the water level high enough to conceal the, the visible liner at the bottom, you're losing a huge amount of water from the turf wicking away and, and soaking up moisture. Um, I mean, that results in a lovely, nice, green, verdant patch of grass around the pond, but it means the pond is going to have to be really frequently topped up. Um, of course, if you don't then top the pond up, eventually the pond level will drop down lower than the level of the roots, and then the grass sitting on top of that strip of liner here isn't getting any moisture and you end up with a dead sort of brown or burnt patch of, of grass right around the edge of the pond. So it's really important that if you've got grass edging the pond like this that the pond is always kept topped up, one to conceal that liner but two most importantly to keep a fresh constant supply of moisture um, to the grass. So what I'm going to be doing, what the brief is for this job is there's a nice shelf all the way around the perimeter of the pond here which is ideal for positioning plants and plants on the pond here are going to help to screen and to hide some of this lining um, but also rock work you can see here there's a, a little flat stone that's been put into position and that's given me the idea that i want to build up stone from down here on the shelf submerged underwater so that as the water level drops it doesn't reveal liner but it reveals stonework and you'd have to allow the pond to drop a long way before you'd start to expose liner so stonework can be built up on the shelf, level with this stone, allowing the grass turf to just flop over the edge of that um, stonework. So that we're keeping the, the sort of symmetry of the pond, we're keeping the, the, the visual appearance of the grass all the way around the same. Um, and we're not losing this strip of grass by having a, an additional sort of width of stone. But it will conceal that liner and it will also help to, to bring those roots slightly further away from the water so the grass itself isn't going to be soaking away quite so much moisture and in doing so I can reduce this overlap of, of liner and allow the grass to be sitting directly on top of the soil rather than on top of the liner as it is now. So that's the plan. Over the next couple of days I'm going to be dropping the level of the pond down to below the shelf so I can get in the pond and start working. Um, tomorrow I'll start bringing in some materials so I can start to lay the stonework. Um, leaving areas free so that we can plant up as well because that's really important. We don't just want a stark sort of you know wall of stone. It needs to be broken up and softened with, with planting. Um, so yeah, three or four days time, the pond should start looking very different. Now the first thing that I'm going to have to do once I drain the pond down lower than that shelf where the stonework is going to sit is I'm going to have to expose all of the overlap of liner by pulling this turf back. But of course, as soon as I start laying stone in the pond, I'm going to reduce the overall dimensions of the pond and the pond volume slightly um, by the thickness of the stone, which I don't want to do. I don't want to lose that size of that shelf because it's, it's quite a broad shelf, about 18 inches in, in, uh, in width, which is perfect for standing plants on. Quite often shelves are far too small in ponds, and they're leaning the wrong way and you know plants are, are tipped into the pond. So this is perfect for planting. I don't want to reduce that any further. So what I'm going to have to do is to, to pull this turf back 
expose this strip of pond overlap and dig away the earth, dig away the bank behind it sufficiently that I can lay the stonework and still retain that full width of the shelf. Um, thankfully here the pond has been laid very well and enough um, liner overlap has been left in place to allow me to expose the liner to dig it away and there's enough liner left for me to put this back so I can start to build up the stonework. And that's a really important lesson when you're laying ponds and you're building ponds. You always want to make sure that you leave a good sort of 30 centimetre overlap of pond liner so that in the future, if ever you're doing anything, you've got that flexibility to, to make some alterations, to make some enlargements. If you trim the liner too short, have it right up against the edge of the pond flush, um, you haven't got that flexibility to do so. So the first job, once I've drained the pond down, is to expose this liner and to start digging away this strip to give me space to build up stone. Okay, so I've dropped the level of the pond and I've reserved all of the water in this very handy bowser here. Um, I've drained it out actually with the, uh, the Awaza Pond of 5. It's powerful enough to be able to drain that pond down in about sort of half an hour or so, which has done the job. And I've dropped the level down here lower than the level of the shelf so that the liner can be peeled away and stonework can begin to be built up from that level shelf there. Now, a couple of pointers. It's always a good idea to mark on the liner the water level before you start to drain the pond, just to give you a, a visual guide. So I've sort of just scraped on the side of the liner there uh, a little visual indicator um, for reference, which I'll make a note of. It's also worth thoroughly inspecting the liner before you start to lay stone on it. Now, obviously, all this strip of liner has spent its life above water level. And when you've got large overlaps like this around the pond, if people are putting netting around the pond or putting some sort of peg around the pond, it's quite often that the liner here gets spiked. And once I start to dig away this ground, this strip of liner is going to become submersed underwater. And of course, it's important that if there are any holes found, that they're repaired and fixed. Now, I've had a good look and I have actually found a little piece of wire just poking through the, the pond liner here. And that will be underwater once I finish doing what I'm planning on doing. So this is going to have to be repaired. It's only a small hole. Um, the integrity of the liner is very good. It's very supple. It's in great condition. So it's going to be easy to make a good patch on this. This is the only bit of damage I found on here. Um, but it was essential that this is looked for. Um, I'm also going to just brush away all of the, the weed and, and bits and pieces. There's a lot of tadpoles that have sort of maroon themselves in little puddles here we go which obviously i want to save so all that's going to get carefully brushed off back into the pond um, so i can preserve as much of the pond life as possible so the next job now is to start to dig away this soil So the bulk of the soil has been dug out, hasn't taken very long, it's a nice nice loose soft soil in this area which is great and you can see now I've, I've broadened and enlarged the, the shelf by sort of another six inches or so. Um, keeping the water in the pond like this is, is a great sort of visual guide for me to know that the shelf is relatively level, uh, I mean it's not, it's not billiard smooth, you can see that the shelving on this side of the pond is a lot higher than, than this side. But the area you're going to be viewing, this back wall here, is relatively level enough. And bearing in mind that the stonework is going to be six inches underwater, a couple of inches discrepancy here and there doesn't cause any issues at all. So the next job now is to give the liner a good clean. I'm going to give the ground beneath the liner a good tamp just to firm it all down and just to get rid of any imperfections, sharp rocks, bits of roots, that kind of thing that, that could cause problems for the liner. Uh, and then I'm going to go and pick up some materials, some rocks, uh, sand and cement. Right, well I've been to go and get the rock and the cement and other materials. Um, so I'm now just tamping over the, the shelf to make sure that I firm down the, the ground to make it nice and solid, to knock down any sort of imperfections and stones. And I'm just using a little sort of tarmac tamp like this. The ground's lovely and sandy and soft here, so it's a nice, a nice material to work with. And there are very few stones and sort of sharp objects but it's worth going over and doing this. I can assure you that if you don't, when you lay the liner back over, you can always feel something sharp sort of poking through, and then you have to take it all apart again to try and find that stone and, and get rid of it. So preparation 
is always key. Let's get the basics right and get the first bit done right. And everything else is a lot easier. Okay, so I'm just tackling that damaged area of liner that I found. I've given the, the area a clean to get rid of all of the muck and debris. It's dried off and I'm just getting rid of any of the, the dust and the, the powder and bits and pieces and the loose material. Now I've gone over it with um, a bit of wire wool just to scratch up the surface a little bit so that the, the glue I'm going to use for the patch has got a better surface to bond to. And I'm going to put patches on the front and the back of the lining. So a bit of belt and braces. So I've got a couple of patches here that I've just made out of um, some off cuts of uh, some green seal rubber liner. I've given these a really good clean as well because new liner is covered in kind of a greasy film that repels um, water and it will stop the sealant from, from sticking properly. Um, but for um, some more detail on repairing liner, I've got another video which you can watch separately, which we'll, we'll go into further detail. Good morning, it's another day and I'm making progress now on the construction side of the job. So you can see now what my plan was, having dug out the shelf and created that extra space, I've now started to lay some stone, starting on the shelf level, submersed beneath water level, um, water line's probably going to be around here, so we've got a good six to eight inches of stone underwater and a few inches of stone above the surface of the pond as well, which is nice. And then as I work my way round the pond, the turf that was there originally is then going to get folded back over so we've kept the same sort of appearance all around the outside of the pond but instead of seeing that strip of liner which is always visible particularly when the pond level drops we're exposing stonework the, uh, the stone i'm using it's a lovely rock to, to use it's called west sussex sandstone or horsham stone there's very few places left that that quarry this but it's a very hard wearing sandstone, it splits nice and easily um, and it naturally forms these quite sort of flat pieces which is ideal for dry stone wall building uh, and for construction work like this. So it's definitely my stone of choice and I think it's a lovely sort of natural buff colour. When it gets wet you get some lovely um, sort of strata marks on the, on the stonework. That's not the best of pieces but there's some, some very nice pieces. Lots of natural fossils occurring as well. Uh, you get naturally sort of um, water-worn pieces of stone which is sort of fossilized riverbed which look really nice particularly when used with cascades and you've got flowing water flowing over the top of it so it's a lovely stone so the way I'm laying the stone I've got off cuts of liner which I'm placing down to protect the main pond liner that's really important you don't want to have any stonework um, positioned directly on top of the pond membrane um, I'm using a four to one Portland cement base mix. Trying to use it sparingly, of course, we don't really want cement mixed up in the pond. Uh, if we can help it, the livestock and the fish aren't really going to appreciate the, the lime that's going to get released from the cement um, and it's going to buffer the water. It's going to make it very hard and alkaline, certainly for the first season. So we want to reduce and limit the amount of cement that's going into this. So I'm effectively dry stone walling. You, you could do this completely dry without any cement, um, but I like to use a bit of cement just to um, sort of firm the stonework in, bed it in, it's a, it, it makes it easier to level the stonework as well, which is nice. Um, and it's just a, a slightly more kind of strong structure. If you're walking around the edge, I don't want to have any loose and wobbly stones. All these nooks and crannies that you get in between the stones are fantastic habitat for wildlife, frogs and newts and other uh, pond life like to, to live in there. And when you've got some of these cracks above the surface of the water, it's a great place to, to sort of pocket little alpine plants, um, shade loving, moisture loving ferns and mind your own business and, and that sort of thing, which looks very nice and helps to soften this stonework. So I've got to work my way around the pond, um, but making good progress today. Good morning, it's another day and this is the final day on the job. Uh, I'm now in the process of filling up and topping up the pond as you can see with my trusty Pondavac 5. So we get all of that reserve pond water put back into the pond and then a little top up from the tap as well. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see the pond level up to the, the, the correct level it should be. 
uh, and I've also come with some plants today which I'm going to pot on if you can hear me over the noise of the pond back I've got a, a water lily which I need to clean up and and uh, pot on and then we've got two varieties of iris so I will document me potting these on shortly Okay, so for the final part of the job here, I wanted to put a few marginal plants on the shelves around the pond just to break up the stonework uh, and to, to get something to break the surface of the pond just to create a bit more interest. And I've got here a selection of a few plants. I've got some, some variegated yellow flag iris. This is uh, Iris Pseudochorus variegata. Um, it's not quite as invasive or quite as robust or large as the traditional yellow flag iris, the um, Iris Pseudochorus. This is slightly smaller, which is more in keeping with a, a sort of a standard domestic pond. Gets to about four feet in height, nice bright yellow flowers, uh, and it retains this variegated foliage for most of the season. So that's a nice easy plant to go with. And then I've also got some slightly smaller um, Iris Versicolor, purple flag iris, American flag iris, there's a few different names for this one. Uh, this little chap here gets to about 80 centimetres in height, so a bit smaller. Lovely purple flowers, which will be flowering very, very shortly. So it's a good time to get this in the pond. We've got enough here to create a couple of nice dense baskets of iris. Um, and that will go either side of the, of the pond to break up the transition between the pond liner and the stonework. And then finally, I've also got some unidentified water lilies. These are from a collection I have at home. Um, size wise, this is sort of a medium. So it's a large saucer sized leaf and it's either going to be a pink or a white. I won't know until it goes into flower. But again, just a couple of, of water lilies, quintessential pond plant. There aren't any in this pond and it's lovely to have some pads at the surface, some flower buds already. So some lovely flowers breaking the surface shortly. Lilies are going to help to shade the pond, provide a bit of cover for the fish. Um, but aesthetically, they're just a lovely, beautiful plant to have in a pond. Marginal plants themselves, actually, apart from the, the cosmetics, the aesthetics, um, they're very useful in a pond and actually marginal plants are really good at helping to mop up nutrients in the water, uh, helping to compete with green water and blanket weed and if you've got enough of them, effectively starving the pond of nutrients and stopping the algae from growing. But you do need a lot of plants in a pond for that to be effective. Um, as a general rule, about two thirds of a pond wants to be full of plants, a combination of um, surface shade plants like lilies, water hawthorns, aponogeta and that kind of thing. Uh, marginal plants around the edge breaking the surface and the typical kind of staple pond weed, Elodia crispa, hornwort, that kind of thing. And if you've got a good combination of plants um, and a reasonable volume of water to start with, because it's not very easy to achieve in a small pond, but if you've got a good volume of water, sort of a thousand gallons plus, you can generally achieve a reasonable balance in a pond just using plants. As long as you haven't got the pond heavily stocked with fish, that's important. If you've got a lot of fish in there, without filtration and without a UV, it's very difficult to maintain any sort of level of clarity. So, this iris was from a very large clump of iris that needed to be split desperately. I've done that off camera, but it was very obvious it just wanted to tease apart, the root mass wanted to tease apart into these sort of individual clumps of, of rhizo. Um, all you need effectively is a shoot and a root, uh, and in this case a bit of the thick rhizome root and a few of the white fibrous sort of tap roots, and you're good to go with the irises. And that's also true of the water lily. A chunk of the rhizome, um, you'll notice that from the rhizome you've got these little growing tips, these eyes, with new growth emerging. And each one of these has the potential to become a new lily quite, quite successfully. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the main bulk of the growth on each tip of the rhizome. But we should get, with two of those in a basket, a nice amount of lily growth very quickly. Now traditionally you would pot on marginal plants and water lilies with an aquatic compost, a lime-free compost, lower nutrient. Um, as, as sort of years have gone by, I've used this less and less frequently. Um, compost, apart from the expense, is also quite messy. You have to line baskets with either a hessian sack or a, or a lining basket to stop the soil from leaching out of the basket, which inve you know, inevitably happens. Um, you've got to layer a, um, you know, a few inches of dressing shingle on top of the soil to try and stop the fish from rummaging around in the basket, uprooting the plants and getting all that soil out, which ends up in the pond and sort of muddying the pond. And instead what I use, is just a fine 10 mil gravel. You could use horticultural grit as well, which is a bit finer, but when you've got fish in the pond, slightly bigger gravel makes it harder for the fish to, to rummage around. 
If you've got koi in a pond, you might want to go up to 20 mil gravel, but you don't want to go any bigger than that really, because it's going to start to impede and get in the way of the plants. Um, and then if you've got large koi in a pond, you really want to be introducing plants in a, in a different way so that the fish can't get to them in the first place. But in this pond, in this application, it's just a few small goldfish, so they'll be absolutely fine with the, the 10 mil gravel I've got. Now I've got some, some classic plastic pond baskets, some mesh baskets. Um, I'm going to use the two contours for the iris and then the slightly larger square for the water lily. It's really important that you choose a, a suitable basket for the size of the plant. Um, I mean, actually this is, you wouldn't want to go any smaller than this for the yellow flag variegated, but with the gravel anchoring it down, that should be okay. And I want to restrict growth. I don't want to have too much of this because it will get bigger than the purple. For the water lily, certainly you wouldn't want to go smaller than a basket like this, unless you're um, planting a pygmy or a, or a very small variety. And in fact, if you've got a large variety of lily, you might want to go for an even bigger basket. Again, having a large basket ensures you've got lots of weight, lots of ballast and gravel in the, in the basket, which is going to hold and anchor the plant down. These rhizomous roots on the iris, and particularly the water lily, as they grow and they can get really, really thick, they become very buoyant. And that coupled with the foliage, which is also very buoyant, if you haven't got them well anchored down in a basket in the first place, you quite often find in the summer, summer months when they've got full leaf, that the plant is, you know, sort of floats to the surface, it's drawn to the surface and then needs to be potted on. So put it in a good sized basket to begin with and you'll have a few years of sort of trouble free um, plants within the pond. So I'm filling the baskets for about one third full of shingle. And then simply choosing a few clumps of iris, making sure that they've all got a decent piece of rhizome and the right white roots. I'm just going to lightly position them and rake over a bit of the gravel just to hold them in place. These are going to look lovely once they're in flower very soon. The trouble with iris is They've got a very, very short flowering period and you get a couple of weeks of a beautiful display and then they've gone. So with pond plants, you really want to stagger flowering times. Try and get some plants that are going to flower early in the season. Some marsh marigolds, a real classic early spring plant. Something which is going to flower a little bit later, like the irises, and then progressing further on into the summer months towards the end of the year, pickerel plants, pondateria, a nice late flowering plant. Filling this basket quite, quite well to put on a reasonable display. Sadly, the pond season is over all too quickly with pond plants, and it won't be long before everything starts to look a little bit sorry for itself. So you definitely got to take advantage of it whilst you can. So I'm now just filling the basket up with a little more gravel making sure that all these plants are well anchored down. Bit of a shake. Now, they don't want to be planted too deep. So if it needs to be, just bring them slightly to the surface so you're just revealing the top of the rhizome. Okay, that's good. Just give them a little bit of a tidy up. Now, with larger varieties of iris when you're doing this, unless you've got some really fresh examples, you quite often find that the leaves start to flop over and in fact the yellow um, variegated flag might do this. And also it presents itself with a much larger sort of face of foliage and until the plants are really rooted down, if you get some windy weather, uh, they're going to blow about and knock around. So it seems a bit, bit cruel and a bit ruthless, but sometimes you've got to chop off you know, a good third of the foliage. And that also helps the plant to concentrate on root growth rather than the, the flowers and the leaf. But with these versicolor, they're not too large. They're gonna be quite well sheltered in the pond here. So I'm very happy with that as they are, as one. I'll do the water lily now.
bit more gravel this time in the basket and I'm just digging out a sort of a slight depression and what I want to do is I want to get the, the rhizome anchored into the gravel so that this growing tip is just at the surface. Again with lilies it's very important, you don't want to plunge these rhizomes down too deep. Um, you can end up rotting the, the rhizome and stopping the new growth. So you can see here this is planted up, there's plenty of rhizome beneath the gravel to anchor it down, to hold it down and stop it floating but we've got a good section of that rhizome and the, and the growing tip there on show. Now again with lilies, quite often, particularly if you buy them when they're in flower and the flowers are open, unless you're able to plant it at the exact depth that the plant was growing in when it was in flower, you're probably going to have to cut those, those flowers off. But don't worry, you're going to get you know, more buds coming through. The trouble is that a submersed bud will continue to grow to the surface, but a bud which is opened, a flower, isn't going to, isn't going to grow any further. So if you submerse that flower, unless it's only a few mil underwater, and you might find you get a tiny bit of growth, um, it's going to remain submersed in the pond uh, and it's going to die and, and close off. So trim those off. gravel around here. Plenty. Now before I put these in the pond, the gravel is very, very dirty, very dusty and sandy. And this will need a really, really good rinse with a hose before I put it in the pond. And that'll just wash through. You'll see all of the, the muck and the detritus will rinse out of the gravel. Last one, we'll do a mixed pot here. Some of the taller yellow flag, then some purple at the front. Make sure when you're choosing plants for a pond that the plants you go for are in scale and suitable for the size pond. A lot of plants, particularly native pond plants, given the right conditions and all they really want is a sunny position and some water, which they get a plenty in the pond, they can become very rampant and particularly the, the native yellow flag iris, the pseudochorus, they can grow to about sort of four and a half, five feet in height, but they can create some very dense, thick rafts of foliage. And the only way to deal with that is to, to really sort of chop it up into sections with a, with a handsaw. Um, and it can become quite heavy and quite difficult to manage. So rather than get that issue in the first place, choose plants that are suitable for the, for the volume of, of uh, water you've got. You might be wondering where the plants are getting its nutrients from if it's not planted into aquatic compost or soil. And actually aquatic soil is lime free and it's also very low in nutrients. Pond plants will obtain the most of their nutrients through the water, through the roots in the water, nitrates and phosphates, um, which are evident um, in a pond, particularly if you've got fish, some of the fish waste, they produce the nitrates and, and uh, and the phosphates but they also obviously use 
sunlight to photosynthesize. So the, the planting medium that the, the plant has gone into, in this case the gravel, is purely a substrate to root into to anchor down. And don't think of it as a, as a source of nutrients. If you want to, you can annually put some root tablets into marginal plants and I think flowering plants like irises uh, and water lilies that have rhizomes where they store energy. Uh, it's a good idea in spring to put in some of these fertilizer tablets and that will give them a really good, good start and a good display for the rest of the season. Um, but this time of year I don't need to worry about that at all. So that's it for planting them on. They need a good rinse and then I can introduce them into the pond. Right, well that's the end of this job. I think, I hope you'll agree but this homework certainly is a nicer visual image than the online that was there originally. Um, I think going into the future, there are a few other um, sort of additions we can make to this pond. I think this area is crying out for a small, small cascade. Um, but these are hopefully sort of future improvements that we can, we can tackle. Otherwise, I hope you've enjoyed watching the video. Thank you very much. Um, if you do like it, please like and subscribe. Uh, and I need to thank all of my current subscribers so far. Um, thank you very much for subscribing. I now have enough to have my own personal channel, so if you want to view any other material that I've done, if you just go on to, to YouTube and just type in Crystal Clear Aquatics, you'll see my little water lily icon, or click on that, and then you can see all of the videos that I've done so far. So, thank you very much, much appreciated. Right, well, that's done with this one, and now it's on to the next job. Thank you for watching. I'm Ed from Crystal Clear Aquatics.